um, welcome and welcome to uh, this specific conversation, which is part of the critical conditions of uh, the mind of nature. And this conversation is breathing art into environmental issues and is hosted by Dr. Yasmin Radasito. I hope I'm saying this right. Well done. Well done. <laughs> and Yasmin, very welcome. Um, yes, I would like to start by uh, asking you to tell us a little bit more about you and your work. Um, Okay, so good morning everyone and uh, good morning Shazeb and thank you so much for inviting me to be part of um, what I, well, I, I see as a very inspirational future sort of thinking thing. So uh, very briefly, I um, started life as a scientist. Uh, I was meant to be a doctor, but that didn't happen. But I went off into the sciences, did my first degree. But ever since I was very little, I used to draw. So I'm an only child spent my head buried in books and drawing very nerdy indeed <laughs> so created this own my own little world if you like uh, but whilst i was studying the sciences i was still making art i was still painting i was still doing portraiture so i was all kind of self-taught and then i went off to do my phd at ucl and i was doing a lot of life work a lot of life drawing and i had one brilliant tutor who kind of said you really should go and do a foundation in art and so whilst I was at UCL in the day, pretending to be a physicist in the evening, I was uh, doing a foundation of art in Gold, at Goldsmiths. And when I left UC, um, I knew I didn't want to do research anymore. I was just not, uh, what's the word, rigorous enough. I'm, I'm just not rigorous enough to, to be a researcher. And uh, at the time I met up a business partner, we started doing outreach in schools. This is quite a few years ago, I don't, I still do some, but we were traveling all over the country, basically delivering science and maths. And as I continued, because there weren't any outreach companies at the time, and as I continued, more of the art started going into the practice. And, and then more and more people kept asking me how I think, you know, how, how do you think the way that you think? And I, I really didn't understand what they meant. Uh, and I was kind of think, oh, right, the way that I think is it different? And I realized this idea of joining all these seemingly very eclectic and disconnected things is something, certainly now, there are so many books on innovation and creative thinking, but there weren't at the time. So I kind of reverse engineered it and um, had been de delivering a great deal of that because not only do I find it incredibly exciting for me, but I think this is the way that we change the future. Uh, just to give you a brief sort of, so for example, when we consume, when we go shopping, we have a great anticipatory high of, of dopamine, this reward that we're gonna get, but you also have the same kind of reward when you're creating, when you're making. And I'm thinking if every individual can be given the permission to make or create, they don't need to consume in the same way. And then the environment crept up on me. I, I wasn't, it wasn't something that I chose. It was almost something that chose me. You meet people who live in different places. I'm a city girl and, and I always thought that the country was for older people that's what you did when you retired I didn't really get it and then I kept visiting and it kept blowing my mind and, and then I remember my father who grows all his own food and is very much my grandfather grew his own food and I started to become very interested in these kind of planting by the moon and just the joy of going out and picking up a warm tomato outside in Italy and having it in your salad I mean there aren't many joys like that and of course the story of plastics was starting to happen at the same time and then the story of, of pollution and air and it's almost as if all the threads it was almost as if the story was always there and they just i just had to join all the dots together and then invariably when you are given opportunities to create things um so a few years ago i was asked to create a sculpture for euston which is going up fairly shortly and I couldn't, I couldn't make a public art sculpture out of my normal materials. It, they wouldn't last. They wouldn't, they wouldn't be hardy enough. And the joy of having the science background that I do is I have an amazing network of engineers and scientists that I know. So I met this group who were working with a material that wasn't intended for art. It was intended for cladding or insulation. And one of the amazing byproducts of the material is that it can absorb a huge amount of NOx from the air. Now, NOx is the, the horrible brown stuff that cars emit as a byproduct of their combustion. And it's the thing that exacerbates breathing difficulties. You, can, you kind of absorb it, it go, goes into the bloodstream and uh, irritates the lungs. And this, again, was not, you know, it, it wasn't, 
it was interesting, but it was when it became personal. And I think that's part of the problem that we have with what's happening in the environment. Very often it's out there. It's somebody else's problem. It's not happening to me. And it was only when it became personal that my son had an asthma attack about what four, four, four and a half years ago, proper one, that I really sat in A&E that evening and thought, oh my goodness, I have never thought about the nature of the breath and the fact that we take it for granted. And, and so all these things fed together. And so now I'm creating sculptures that can absorb pollution. Obviously it's not an answer to the problem, but I also believe that people don't listen to things with stick, they listen to things with carrot. <laughs> and art is a wonderful carrot. It's a wonderful way of getting people to re-examine their perspectives uh, without blame. Um, and, and that's what I'm hoping that my work will continue to do. Amazing. Um, I think it's really interesting. We know that between 28 to 30, 36,000 people um, die in the UK, just in the UK, and these deaths are attributed to air pollution. Um, we also know that one third of like people with like asthma or like strokes and heart attacks, a lot of one third of these cases are associated with air pollution. So, in a way, it became like a topic that we are talking about, and that people are now more interested in than they were before because they didn't really have access to this data. And when we do public art is about like, you know, expanding that to a wider community. Um, and I was, I was, uh, we were talking about this just before, like um, when I was doing work with communities in London, measuring air pollution in their areas and around their schools, um, measuring levels of NOx and particulate, to particulate matter. Um, what I really realized was that people are super interested in this subject because it's something that affects them directly like you mentioned about your son and the question is how do we then and i really liked your analogy with the carrot and art <laughs> <laughs> how do we kind of do i i'm interested to also understand is there a way to also co-create that art and that bring that art to public spaces with those communities is that something that you think we can do and we can promote <laughs> It requires legis legislative change. That's a difficult word to say, isn't it? So I remember reading once that if you want to create any type of revolution, <laughs> any type of real change, you only need something like 3% of the population to get behind it, which is still a lot of people. And we can drive the awareness. Invariably, people who are aware are not always the decision makers and people that can really change things. So it is... It's about the makers, it's about the communities, but it's also about legislation and it's about bringing it to the government so that they can change things. I don't think we can't do it in isolation. So um, I do know at the moment that there is, I think some of the best lawyers in the world, aren't they? They're, they're trying to create some sort of legislation whereby the environment is protected. It has, it has its own laws so that you can't just keep you know, going and taking and, and, and <laughs> taking it for free. So communities obviously, because again with public art, what's very interesting, because this is what I've learned, is um, sometimes people can resist things purely because they don't like the aesthetic of something. Um, and obviously people you know, have a voice and invariably sometimes the people who resist things, <laughs> everyone else is kind of okay with it. So sometimes people don't realize that something is good for them, if that makes any sense. Um, and, and it's, yeah, how you communicate, how you have these conversations, and people do need to be heard, they do need to have an input. But as an artist, it's incredibly difficult, because for me, I will have my aesthetic, and that's my aesthetic. I'm the artist, you want me to, make, I will do that. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a little bit of give and take, and un, again, it's about perspective, it's about understanding why something's being made, how it can help. Because invariably, if you look at public art, so many pieces of public art have been um, not terribly well received when they've been made. And then afterwards, people think, how did we ever live without it? <laughs> so yeah, the community does need to, to take a part in this because especially if there's a bigger message, I mean, not all public art is necessarily creating you know, a great big environmental message and it doesn't have to. Um, we can have things just because they make you stop. So I think it's a combination of all of these things, Shazad, yes. 
Um, and in terms of like um, COVID and the pandemic we are in, um, I think it's really interesting that we realized that the levels of pollution dropped significantly in very like in a in a space of like probably two months. And um, I think it was quite powerful to understand that if we do take action we actually can change things and, and air pollution was one of them. Um, how do you perceive that as, do you think it's something that it will empower us and artists, community and, and also politicians to understand that we can have an effect and we can change or it's something that will somehow, you know, we, we will go back very quickly to just kind of what we were doing before. I think that's why conferences and panels like this are so important because if you think about it it was probably the biggest global experiment in a way and I hate to put it like that because I know Covid is real and it's affected a lot of people and people have lost people and and that you know at the end of the day is an incredibly personal thing but looking at it as a scientist we have never had such a great nobody's ever been able to press the pause button in that way whether we wanted it or not. And, you know, again, like everyone else, I had four days of complete existential angst when all this happened. I was watching the news 24 hours a day. And after four days, I went, do you know what? If you keep on doing this, you're just going to hide under the bed and never come out again. So I thought, okay, you have to see this as something that is powerful that can be used as a message. And ironically, at, not ironically, paradoxically, at the same time, I was creating a sculpture for a museum in South London, the Horniman Museum. And the timing couldn't have been any more perfect because they were building a, a bee garden. Uh, because as we know, bees are responsible. I think is it one, every, one in every three mouthfuls of food are because of bees. And, the, and we now know, you know, it's still kind of new research, but we now know that pollution affects bees. They can't find their pollinating flowers if there's too much pollution in the air. So they were building this bee garden and, and I came along with the sculpture and I created a sculpture which is in the bee garden. So the idea is that hopefully it cleans enough of the local air amongst the flowers to encourage the bees. And we've had an informal insect counter and it has been bonkers because I've been, I've been visiting throughout the summer I was visiting and the number of bees and butterflies. So I thought this, this works and because of COVID, because people couldn't go anywhere else, the museum gardens were heaving, as all parks and everything else were heaving. And, and that idea of actually I get as much joy from this as I would from the other activities, whether it's buying or working continuously or running or whatever. So people could slow down. And I think that they noticed that there was not the noise of the aeroplanes, that there weren't the, you know, the, the, the patterns in the sky, that all of a sudden you had to slow down. And, and I know for some people that's incredibly difficult. If you get your energy as an extrovert from being with people, that's hard all of a sudden when you're cut off. I mean, as, as an artist, if somebody says, I need you to go into your art cave, I go, okay, no problem. <laughs> you know, but I realize it's not that easy for everyone. Some people really do need external energy, but... I'm hoping that they were starting to get it from their environment because I knew a few people who are extroverts and were going out and, and they suddenly thought, actually, I'm getting a buzz just from being outside and noticing things that normally I don't have time to notice. So as with all, you know, when we all have good kind of resolutions, we need to keep reinforcing. And that's why things like this and discussions like this are very powerful because kind of go, you know what, it is possible. If you think about how quickly the vaccine has been developed, something that could normally take a couple of decades, you know, it's been done in months because people have collaborated, they've come together. And, and that's the thing. And I was listening to the Dalai Lama a while ago and his new, his new mantra is the seven billion is one. And he is kind of thinking, how do I get people to see that every individual on this planet is effectively one? So yes, I think COVID has been an enormously powerful lesson. And of course, it's probably, I hope it doesn't, but because of the way that we are treating nature and the way that animals are losing their habitats, what's to say this won't happen again? So it's a lesson that we have to, it's a warning and it's a lesson and we have to take from it and we have to try and find the positives. And, you know, as I say, like everyone else, I have my down days as well about it all. 
but never before have we had an opportunity to see what could possibly happen if we changed our ways. So that's really exciting. Yeah. yeah I think one of the most powerful moments um, during the lockdown was, I mean, it was all very scary. I completely agree. And I think I was, I, I would wake up and like feel so anxious. I was like trying to meditate and like really like not being able to like, you know, stop my mind of like worrying uh, but one of the most most powerful things for me was when one day I went cycling to central London and you know you go to Oxford Street which is normally like full of like people buying 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 and it was there was no one it was empty it was just it was basically desert town and I found that so powerful and like okay there is actually a way to reset all this mindset of like consuming and, and buying as you said i also like that that if we use art to go away from that people will probably appreciate it more than this kind of empty way of consuming at the same time though um in the summer when things started opening up again i remember I went to the V&A and when I was coming back, cycling through region, um, Oxford Street again, and it was, there were thousands of people on the street again, all trying to buy stuff. And I felt a bit sad because I thought, okay, but we had an opportunity to kind of reset. And when things start opening up again, people actually want to go and shop again. And how do we maintain is like how do how how can we help um you know keep that state of like okay we don't need to consume as much i mean of course if we've been deprived from consuming maybe the reaction will be like okay i want to consume again but how do we do that transition in a way or we, we can help that transition in a way that is less abrupt and is more like smooth and we don't get to the levels we were before is there a way to art there as well Oh no, a big time creativity. I was talking uh, about this fairly recently. And also, it's like any of these things, right? You can't change your entire life overnight. You know what it's like when you wake up and go, right, today I'm going on a diet, I'm going to go to the gym, I'm going to eat really well, I'm not going to watch TV. And by the evening, you haven't done any of those things because you've overwhelmed yourself. It's you too much. Meanwhile. <laughs> Right, you can't you can't change everything overnight. I've I've experienced that as well, um, but and also I don't know whether people were really consuming because I know that I was desperate to go out and look at a couple of exhibitions. I wasn't desperate to go shopping, but I was desperate to go and see some new things. But one of the things I have become quite interested in recently, and I'm going to be talking to a, a company that deals in the neuroscience of all of this soon is the chemicals that we release when we're making creating and when we're consuming for example or when we're in nature and i've suddenly become very interested in this so um i'm a bit of an ideas junkie i always say to my students i want you to be junkies as well and they go what do you mean with ideas with ideas because you know what it's like every time um you come up with something or you're incubating or whatever you get big you know, big high to the brain and then you go off and you have a go. As I said before, it's the similar thing that you get from consuming. Endorphins, you get um, these one from exercising, but you also get them from massive laughs. You know, serotonin. So these feel good things that we get from other things are things that we can get from nature. We can get them from interacting together and we can get them from being creative. And one of the real joys over COVID, and this, this really surprised me, is I went back to some of um, my older work. There was, I remember Alexander McQueen, they were doing a thing where every week they would post up a picture of one of their beautiful dresses. And then they would invite people on Instagram to recreate it as a painting or as a piece of craft or whatever. And I remember doing one and the response to it was quite phenomenal because it, it, it was a watercolor. I'd done a watercolor, which I hadn't done for a long time. And people were messaging me going, what brushes do you use? What paint do you use? What? And all of a sudden I had people that I'd never spoken to before who were starting to play again. They were starting to play and, and saying, oh God, I'm really enjoying this. I haven't done this since I was a kid and I haven't. And so they were starting to occupy time. I had families that were doing activities with their children. So of course it was helping relationships which were quite fraught because everyone's on top of one another. But 
if you could come out with something like that and think, hey, I've, I've kind of got new skill, I've been creating new things, and I've been given permission to go and do something that I didn't think I was allowed to do anymore. So I don't, I really don't think it's a matter of saying to people, you need to consume less. I think it's about finding ways of reproducing, replacing the ways that you feel like a good human being with something else. Because let's face it, if you punish people, they're not gonna, they're not gonna want to do it. But if you give them something even better, so I'm still thinking about this, Shazeb. This is all kind of stuff that's kind of going around in my mind because I'm also working on a, on, a, on a series of 2D works, which I'm calling Blueprints for the Future. And they're based on cyanotype, which was an 18th century way of using chemicals and, and, you know, and the sun. So it's very eco-friendly, it's very sustainable. And I am wanting to produce this kind of blueprint for the future. And some of it will involve the, you know, could we, is there a sort of brain computer interface? Not, not sort of um, just something that you would put on, something that would help you. So, yeah, I think it's much more fundamental. I think it's how do we replace that feeling? And then as a knock-on effect, you will find that people will behave better. They will have better habits. I think that's how it works <laughs> for me. <laughs> um. No, I agree. I think it's an interesting perspective and an and interesting way of, and I think very hopeful way of looking at it as well. Like how do we replace or how do we draw attention to something that is actually better for yes. individuals, but also for uh, the climate and, 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 and for uh, the world and for planet earth in general. Um, and yeah, I was, I wanted to know a little bit, a bit more about your uh, the sculpture you are working on. You you mentioned it's going to be uh, inaugurated soon. Um, can you tell? So, me? so the one in the Horniman has gone in, and the feedback from that has been, we've won one award. We've had goodness knows how much press from it, and the amount of interest has been has been great. The other one is meant to go up in Houston soon as Houston is the second most polluted road in the country, but because it's logistically, it's a bit more complicated. Um, it's just taking a little bit of time. There is something out, stuff I can't really talk about for next year, but um, yeah, the, the, the momentum and the interest in the work is growing. And obviously more and more people are saying, can the material be used for this or can it be used for that? Or, um, but I kind of, I'm still pioneering, I am still pioneering how to use this material because that's the thing, it's not really been used for sculpture before. And so the last three years, I'm again, right, how do I take this stuff <laughs> and create shame, shapes and forms and things out of it? So I am, and the, the, the really, really cool thing is the I had not, I always used to think about public art as something that was in isolation. I'm now understanding that a piece of public art has to exist in the space, that it has to complement the space, otherwise it's, it just doesn't work. And I hadn't really thought about that until um, the, the, the head gardener at um, the Horniman, Wesley Shaw, until he built the garden for the sculpture. Because literally the first time I went to see it when all the plants had grown, I nearly started crying. It was so beautiful and it was so perfectly matched. And I thought this sculpture is cleaning the air for this vegetation, for these insects. It couldn't have been any more perfect. So the, the future work that I'm thinking about, it, it, they have to go together. They have, there has to be planting. There has to be something about nature that goes together with these things. Um, so that's been, again, very exciting. You know, sometimes people kind of look at pieces of finished work and they have no idea that literally it can be like the night before that you suddenly have a revelation and go, actually, <laughs> this would, you don't have it all planned. It's very fluid. It's very organic. And, and, and seeing the response of people, that's the other thing that's kind of overwhelmed me because I go in and out. It's like my second office, especially during quarantine, because we could meet people outside and I was meeting journalists and stuff. So to see the way that people were interacting and reading the boards and finding out about bees, it was a really pleasant way of getting a very important message out to people. And the great thing about the Horniman is that it was the first museum to declare a culture emergency. They did that uh, nearly a year ago. And what that means is that they are considering everything they do in terms of its footprints. 
you know, everything from the cups they use to the stirrers they use to can we justify transporting artwork halfway around the world and the cup. So all of this is fundamental to what they're doing and more and more museums are following suit. And, and that's important because if the institute, this is what I was saying you know, at the beginning when we were talking about community, that works, but you need the institutions and then you need the legislation and then you need, you know, so the fact that the museums are doing it and everyone, by the way, can de declare a culture emergency. Um, you know, you can just sign up as an individual, which I have just saying that I'm aware of it. I'm going to try and include it in my work because again, I wasn't on purpose trying to make work that was sustainable, but I realized on the whole it is. Uh, you know, I'm using corn leaves, I'm using old sheets, I'm using Nox tech. I think about my waste now in a way that I didn't before, right? Um, it's almost impossible to make art completely sustainably, because, but, but it's something I'm much more aware of now. And I think more and more artists are becoming much more aware of that now. Uh, because ultimately, if you, have, if you have an endless budget, you can create anything. But the trick is, and, and I've learned this, that the less you have, the more creative you become. Right? And I've done, I've, I learned that from working with kids for 20 years. You know, we were limited. We couldn't use expensive equipment. We couldn't use dangerous equipment. And so the, the, the clever bit is the thinking. This is the thing. Sometimes people think, oh, we have all the solutions. You think, yeah, but that's not the, the trick. It's the thinking bit. How do we, we don't need necessarily more. We just need to think differently. Sorry, I went off on a tangent there. Oof. <laughs> How is, that's really interesting and how was what was the start of this project with the bees like was it a commission was um something that it was a no actually this came from last year right so a lot of my work is in plastics yeah and i started that about 12 years ago and again this was just this was just before the big plastics conversation and i was using that as a physicist because i know that Let's say you want to create a bridge or you want to create, you know, if you're an engineer, you want to create something. You will create it out of plastic. You will look at it in polarized light and polarized light will give you all the colors of the rainbow when you look at this plastic. So if you, if you see the colors and they're very striated, they're very, very close together, you know that that part of the design is under strain. Right? And you go away and redesign it. And I literally, I remember leaping out of bed one morning going, <gasps> that's painting with light. Why didn't I see that? And so I started, I literally, for three years, I was one of those really scary ladies that if somebody was eating a sandwich wrapped in plastic, I go, give me your plastic. <laughs> give me your plastic. I was just picking up plastic from everywhere to see whether it was, the term is birefringent. So in other words, some plastics will do it some way. So they will split light into various colors. And I started creating, the first piece was for Hove Museum and it was called Precious. And the idea was to take rubbish because we were in the rubbish tips and to create something beautiful. So I was working in plastics and I, I will be going back to that, but um, I couldn't, as I say, I couldn't create something out of plastic for outside. So, and what was your question again? <laughs> it was about the bee. Oh, that's right. Right, that's right. And then last year, um, I created a hat with a milner called Carrie, uh, Carrie Jenkinson. So she's a very famous hat maker. And again, I learned about the power of getting the message out in ways that I hadn't anticipated because I'm not hugely into fashion. I mean, I do like things. Uh, I'm very much one of those people who, um, now it's called vintage, isn't it? But for years I was going into secondhand shops all the time. And we created this hat out of, uh, made of butterflies, out of disused plastic. And a young woman called Serena Churchill, who was the great granddaughter of Winston Churchill, she wore it for us at Ascot. Now the thing about Ascot is, you know, it's, I've never been, but it's a big social event. You get the decision makers there. You get people who can make a difference. So we were trying to drive awareness to the plight of butterflies. Um, and at the same time, I met the Butterfly Conservation Center that they are, they're headed up by David Attenborough. And I was in conversations with them going, how, how can I use art to try and help drive awareness? One of them introduced me to somebody at the museum. See this wonderful, this is the thing when you, when you're all, passionate about this thing and you all start speaking and then you can see the threads and they were saying oh by the way we're doing something at the Horniman and then it clicked I thought right I'm going to create something for the bee garden so it wasn't none of it's on purpose I think it's just about seeing those threads which I said and um and she's in now yay so uh yeah 
Now that that really, I've got to be honest, and thank you. It's been a real dream project. I, I you know, I'm very incredibly grateful. Um, and how is your work, your scientific work, also received in the artistic world? World, how do they, the two worlds, kind of communicate and? Well, that's difficult because I had to make a decision. I thought I can't, I can't, I can't be equally good at both. It's impossible. It's just impossible. And so I don't think of, I mean, I don't think of myself as a scientist, but I realize that every day I think like a scientist <laughs> in between thinking like an artist. My brain is constantly in this state of flux and I can't help it. But I don't, I don't think about it anymore. It's an intuitive thing. So, okay, so with the science, when I, when I was first making work with machines and things like this, I was very much referencing my science background. And I guess I was trying to envisage, you know, deep, complicated scientific processes through art. That's changed because it wasn't coming from the heart. <laughs> And now I like to make work that comes from the heart. I intuit it. I don't think about it. And uh, sometimes it's very difficult. I cannot be both. I can't make something and then say, right, this is a scientific experiment. We're going to do all these measurements. I need other people to do that. So um, this is, this is, <sighs> it's, it is, it's difficult. Um, it's trying to, the thing that I guess I have been trying to do is to find a language, right? because one of the problems I think we really, really have is that everyone has their own separate language. And one of the reasons I went off to study art again is I realized I did not understand what artists were talking about. I just didn't get it. I was, I was trained as a scientist um, and all this, uh, quite literally to me, it was all very you know, qualitative and it was all a bit airy fairy. And I thought, what are they trying to say? <laughs> I was used to A goes to B and all this type of thing. So I think um, it's taught me how to try and find the common threads. It's taught me how to simplify. It's taught me how to say, this is the most important bit. You don't need to be incredibly scientific in order to understand that this is important. You don't need to be incredibly art sort of, um, what's the word? Um, again, sort of, you know, really understand art language to understand that something is important. I'm still, I not struggle, that's not the right word. Um, it's a bit like my work is both dystopian and utopian and I go between the two all the time. Sometimes it's very dark, sometimes it's very light. Sometimes my work is a bit more scientific, sometimes it's a bit more artistic. I guess I'm still trying to find the answer to that. But what is lovely for me is that now I'm sort of managing more projects almost is that I have enough of the, a common language to be able to speak to designers and engineers and horticulturalists and other artists, and I can bring them all together. So that is one of the things that I think um, is important. I think we have to stop seeing them as separate things as well. I mean, that's kind of a relatively new thing, you know, 100 years ago or so. If you go to the Royal Academy, you've got the Royal Society of Chemistry on one side and, the, you know, the Royal Body of, of Astronomy on the other side. So they were seen as one of the same thing because it was about awe and curiosity and trying to find the answers. And with science, yes, we, we're limited by the laws of nature, which we're not in art. But fundamentally, we are all trying to communicate the awe of the world you know, and, and the existence that we have. And again, I've gone off on a tangent. <laughs> so uh, I can't give you a, a sort of, you know, an explicit answer because I'm still trying to figure it out myself. I find it really interesting when you say that, you know, when it's hard to like turn off your like scientific mindset because you kind of, you've trained for so many years, uh, your brain to kind of think in that way that it will always be part of you. I mean, I feel the same with, with biology and having done research in the PhD in biology. It's like, even in my day-to-day -day life, I'm very scientific in my approach. Um, I do think they are complementary and I do think they will benefit science, science and art and scientists and artists. They will really benefit from working together. Um, I don't know what do you think. I, I mean, I'm also going on a tangent here, but I find <laughs> 
really interesting. I mean, um, the work that is done with science and art, it actually normally starts with the artists that then go to labs or, or go talk to, to scientists and they kind of bring a new perspective on someone else's research and science. I'm actually, I think it's rare to find people like you that actually have a background in science and then they bridge that with the, with the arts. Um, and I often think is like, okay, but, and I mean, I had these conversations with several people is like, but is it because scientists are more restricted and because we are trained in a way that, I mean, we are, we have to be creative to do science, but we are also more restricted and sometimes a bit dogmatic about where we are and where we go. And one of the, the, the limitations I found uh, as a researcher was that if you really want to be very good in your fields, you need to read like 20 papers about this specific <laughs> subject because there is so much re research being done that if you really want to be good at that, you need to really be busy reading all these papers and you get so specialized that it's really hard to then come out of that and have a wider perspective and being able to join these dots that you are talking about. And I wonder like, how can we train scientists to not lose that perspective? I know it's very hard, but how do we, because I think it's so interesting to have that happening, not just the artists looking at the work of the scientists and like, oh, I'm going to do something about that. Great. Great. Having the scientists, no, I want to do something about this myself as a scientist and then incorporating the arts. So I, I find that a challenge. How, how do you see that actually? I, I really agree with you. Oh gosh, there's so much I could say on this. Um, Variably, sometimes I see a great deal of art that is science-based and all they've done is literally take a science experiment and use it. There's not, they're not adding, they're not commenting. It's, because um, science of course can be very wow. And, and I still think that the whole, because don't forget when I was doing it, I was doing it in secret. Now there are many courses on art and science, but they are still in their infancy. I still think that they have a, a great, a long, a long way to go. So there's a couple of things that, yeah, I would really mention. One of the other things, right, is thinking about thinking. <laughs> I've become incredibly interested in that. This idea of metacognition, thinking about how you think. And because I have worked with everything from teeny tiny kids to like CEOs, one of the things that I've realized is that the more expert you become at something, the more closed you become in your thinking. And you're so good at being good at something that it's, almost impossible to think I'm going to try something else and be bad at it like everyone is when you try something new so um, for example I've run with one of my colleagues we, we we've run workshops called uh, creative engineers can change the world so these you know top level engineers that used to come in and uh, <laughs> I could tell that they and they'd come in and there'd be plastic cups and bits of string and straws and, and colored pencils and they'd be going what if I said this evening you're going to play now this concept of playing is incredibly hard for people because again, it's about permission. I think everything that you're saying is, it's permission to not be good at something, it's permission to take a risk, it's permission to, uh, to fail. And I hate that word because there is no such thing as failure, it's just a, a learning thing. So sometimes when you meet, and Harry, actually Harry Croto, you know the, who, uh, who won the Nobel Prize for chemistry, one of the lovely things about him is that he, when he uh, left and he, he went off to, 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 I think it was in America, he started doing kids' books. Right? He started writing children's books and things like this. So it's, what we can do with scientists and engineers, and I have been doing an awful lot of it, is to get them back into that creativity and that playing and that risk-taking and understanding that it doesn't matter how unrelated you think it is to what you're doing, it will make you better because it's going to force you to create new neural pathways. Um, some of the things I will give them at the end of the workshop and uh, invariably because they are so solution-based, you know, I guess what I'm talking about is divergent thinking. 
Scientists and engineers converge. That's what they do. They have to converge upon a solution. And they're so good at it, and they do it for so many years, they've forgotten. They've forgotten that, actually, maybe it's not reading these 20 papers that are completely related to what I'm doing. Perhaps it's looking at something completely different that's actually going to give me the insight. But it's recognizing that opportunity because you're sufficiently open and aware of your thinking to do it. <laughs> so, yeah, I've seen it with the engineers. So, you know, I was really, a couple of them had major existential changes. I got a couple of emails years later going, I left my job, I went, I'm working in the Amazon, I'm doing that. And, you know, that doesn't happen for everyone. But some people kind of go, I'm going to completely change what I'm doing. Um, and it will make you... Because this is one of the things, I was a good scientist because I would go into the lab and I'd have an idea as if from nowhere, something would work, but because I wasn't being really sort of logical in my thinking, I would then spend the next three months trying to work out what I'd done, <laughs> right? And a really good scientist would have written it down. But because I thought about something completely unrelated, it was kind of, so I realized as I say that I wasn't, but so we need scientists to do a bit more of that. The completely going completely out of their subject and what I always say to my students um, go and talk to a psychologist student go and talk to a nursing student go and speak to somebody who's in catering go and speak to people who don't do what you do because it will force your brain to work in a different way and it will make you far better at what you do um, yeah, because again, as you said, with, with, with science, they, we now use so many visuals from 3D rendering to, you know, to obviously graphics, to, to projection. So scientists are having to become much more visually aware in how they present their data. Because you kind of bombard, and informatics, which I find beautiful, I mean, informatics are just beautiful. You can't just bombard people with data. It has to be visually appealing and simple. Um, so I actually see the, they are coming together in a rather beautiful way. We just we just have to find a common language. Don't know if I answered the question again, but great no, tangent. I, I, I know. I really think it's so interesting to think about it because when I was a scientist, I mean, when, yeah, once a science, you are as a scientist. <laughs> I know. I know. But when I was doing research, I mean, this whole thing about visualization. So I was working in embryology. So I was doing actually claymation to like stop claymation what's claymation like with clay just doing stop motion with clay and like i was That's reading so cool. the embryos and like making to really go to a conference and talk about my work and be able to like because embryology is quite uh it's a difficult thing to imagine sometimes and that was really a way for me to you know explain but to also understand um, and again, like what I found, it was very tough. And I mean, I was I, I could, when you were talking about like he would go to the lab and like think about, oh, I'm going to try these. I remember one of one of my papers actually is about a specific mechanism in embryology that I found out because I was working with the embryos, and then I was like, this is so strange because it's actually not like it was in the books. So there must be something here that is not well explained. So I had to kind of come up with like 10 different experiments to prove <laughs> that what I was saying, it was against the books, was actually correct. So I found that struggle in science, and I do think that actually is, that then connects with the fact that the scientists can sometimes be a bit too narrow and too specialized, because the way we do science is sometimes a bit, I normally talk about it as is like, we have this puzzle about the world that we're trying to figure out. And there is one piece that is missing. And when we are looking at that piece, we're like, okay, we, we know that this piece needs to fit this puzzle. So we're going to do research and you know, statistics are some, is something that we can manipulate a little bit. So we're going to find ways that my experiment is going to fit that big puzzle. But yeah. sometimes forget that all the outliers that we find and we're like, oh, these are just outliers can actually be the beginning of some uh, a new puzzle. <laughs> and yeah. I do think sometimes as scientists, we are a bit uh, constrained because also when we apply for grants and when we write a grant, it's normally we have to already have preliminary results. We already have to be biased to that direction of that puzzle and that piece. And I, I think it's so important to then really change that mindset because I do think it's kind of restricting us on our understanding of the world because we're just being so focused on like the dogmas that we already know. 
and which makes like the breakthrough the breakthrough breakthroughs they happen but slower than they would happen if we were actually able to you know free our minds from these little uh, pieces of the puzzle so i do find it so important to have that um also part of like the education of scientists have like how do we train people to be more open oh can i can i interrupt at this point because one of uh, i can't remember which book it is but um i know for example in america they are getting using artists to teach medical students at harvard how to look at art right so they're taking them to look at art and this idea of being able to actually really read a painting is, is transfer because what's happening, of course, you know, especially, you know, the better you are at your science, the more somebody comes in and they're not well, and you just look at them as a set, as a set of symptoms and you have a diagnosis without actually really looking at the person and engaging and thinking, actually, the problem I think you have is not the problem you have. And it's shown a great deal of success. And because that's the thing about artists, they're very good at noticing things. Most people don't really look. They don't really look at all. They don't really notice anything. Not, not, and I'm not saying that you know, we're brilliant at it, but we're more trained in it. Because obviously if you're drawing a face, you've got to really look at that face. And you have to suspend the fact that there are eyes and nose. It has to become a, a bunch of lines or a bunch of shadows so that you literally lose the person. I remember when I was doing life class, I think my father was quite shocked <laughs> that I was drawing you know, people that didn't have any clothes on. And I said, Dad, you have to understand that is not, that's not a person anymore. And I, 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 you know, when I'm looking at that, this is a set of, you know, very difficult shapes and forms that I have to try and capture. So yeah, I think artists are very good at looking at things and that's something that we can definitely teach other people about. Um, yeah, it's like finding ways to, I mean, I, I love that example actually, how to teach medical students how to look at art and appreciate art. I found really nice when you when you said that I didn't understand art and you were like you went on that journey to really understand understanding and grasp it and I think it's because we keep both so separate you know like I had when I was 14 I had to decide do I study art or do I study uh, science and it was like this really clear like, yes. path tooth paths that were very like separate and I do think that then it's reflected on like normally what we ask from like scientists nowadays. And I mean, we are talking about arts and like public engagement is a big buzzword. Uh, and, and now is we normally try to do public engagement. It, it is, it's still quite boring. I go to, I go to a lot of public engage, engagement, like events like Imperial college or like King's college, these big uh, institutions. And then you go to these events and it feels like one of these American like science fairs where they have like the, the volcano and like this yeah, whole yeah, thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. People just change these like so <laughs> like traditional and like old school way of like communicating science. We're trying to give it a little bit of like an artsy like uh, perspective, but it's still very dull and very boring. And... So how can we change that in terms of like helping these collaborations, but also helping scientists to kind of shift their mindsets to be more, more open to, to communicate in a different way as well? It would be wonderful to get them into a, a creative workshop and, and as I said before, get them to play, but then also show them the possibilities of technology, which I'm learning myself at the moment. So, yeah, you, I mean, I still think it's wonderful to have old school experiments that people can repeat themselves at home because, you know, oh God, I've given thousands, thousands of demonstrations. And I would always, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> try and have, if there are a lot of people in the room, try and have a hands-on element that they could engage with me. There is nothing worse than watching somebody else having fun and you can't join in. So I think, I think that's really important. But I think if scientists were more aware of like if you go to the vna the vna have got this down absolutely to a t they had a brilliant exhibition on winnie the pooh last year and it was everything from projection to obviously cutouts to you know pretend poo sticks on the ground to and i just thought this is so clever and so i think yeah if they be, could become more aware of the techniques that we have in the arts from you know projection to 
obviously sculpture and things like this, they could find other ways of presenting their data. And, and that I find really exciting. And I think that's all kind of bubbling away at the moment. I think that's all sort of, so yeah, we start off with simple play, we move them up, you know, show them the possibilities of, of 3D printing, not just from a, a manufacturing point of view, but how can we use it artistically? And sometimes it's the simplest things, you know, I say this to my design students, so you spend so long creating the design, you don't think about that last little element. How do you light it? How do you present it in the space? You know, something like light is a three dimensional sculptural thing. You can, you can change how data and things look just by the way that you light them. Um, so yeah, I think, I think kind of not seeing light, for example, as a, you know, as a wave or whatever it is, but as a, as a sculptural tool, just a very simple, simple example. That would be one of the ways that you could get scientists perhaps to think differently about their work and their data. Interesting. And is this something that, what, when, when is the best time to start that in terms of like in our learning journey? Um, when, when is the, the moment to kind of start implementing these things in, in, in our educational system? Oh, all the time. I, I think, um, again, so, you know, the education system, as we know, is, 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 too, is too old in the way that it, it works. You know, it was designed for an industrial revolution. It was designed for people to have a certain amount of knowledge, but not too much, because obviously we needed people to do everyday boring jobs. But that is changing now. You know, we're entering a conceptual age. And it's about learning perhaps little bits of lots and lots of different things. So it can be something in formal education, but I think people also have to be responsible for their own education and a lifelong learning. And there really is, because one of the other benefits of COVID, and I did it myself, so I thought I'm no good at Photoshop. I need to learn how to do this. And I remember buying a couple of courses and uh, I did start working through it, I'll be honest, I haven't finished it. <laughs> but the fact that you can now pretty much learn anything you want to learn online, or you can find, you know, uh, makers, makers, you know, sites and studios and, and places, you know, uh, hacker spaces and all this type of thing. So I don't think that there's any excuse. And if formal education won't give it to you, you go and find other ways of learning. But I think it has to be a lifelong thing. And, you know, let, you know what it's like with your research. You work so hard to get one piece of data and no one pays attention to it because you're perhaps presenting it in, in the wrong way. If you could be a bit more creative, if you knew that there are other ways of grabbing people. You know, we talk about the, the elevator pitch, which I think used to be two minutes. And now most people wouldn't even listen to you for two minutes. How do you grab somebody? We'll probably do it visually or maybe you do it with sound but I think it's 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 getting the data and then you think how do I present this to you in a way that you just cannot ignore it um, so it is it's lifelong curiosity it's lifelong learning it's um, yeah because it, it going right back to the very beginning of the conversation this gives you joy it makes you happy to do it you know that, especially when people are resisting. I mean, obviously not everyone is like that, but the more resistance you get, sometimes you think, okay, today is a bad day, uh, but tomorrow will be a new day and I'll find a new way of saying it to you. <laughs> but I'm not giving up. <laughs> I think it, like you said, is like play and curiosity. And yes. I think I, I totally agree about like the educational system being a bit like old school for what we have now and 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 people's needs and and and, and interests um and i think this whole thing about play is also like a challenge for us humans because we've been indoctrin indoctr indoctrinated to kind of be okay i need to work i have my job i have my this and i think this whole covid thing is also making us realize that when we kind of take everything away from our life that was kind of bringing meaning to our lives, being um, going to a concert, to a theater play. I have, I know a lot of people that are having these like, you know, existential crisis of like, okay, what am I doing with my life? Because we realize that a lot of these people that are doing jobs in like things that are more like marketing or business or whatever, and they are realizing like, oh my God, what's, what, what am I doing with my time? Because we are realizing that we actually spend 90% of our awaking life 
um, doing something that probably is not of interest for us and for the world. So I do think there is a shift coming from that as well. And I do. It's, it's already happening. I'm going to borrow from an author that I love called Dan Pink. And uh, a book I really recommend is The Future Belongs to Right Hand Side Thinkers. Okay, so I'm being very simplistic when I talk about the left and the right hand side of the brain, but the right hand side is the one where you have flow, you have no sense of time, it's where the creative stuff comes. And he talks, there's one paragraph in the book which I actually adore, I can't remember off the top of my head, but he does say, the past belongs to the number crunchers, the accountants, the money movers, right? The future belongs to the pattern makers, the empathizers the poets, the artists. Now, obviously, I'm going to be slightly biased about all of this, but the point that he does make, and he uses these two phrases, which I use all the time now, high concept and high touch. The future is about these two things. So high concept is, um, it's about, actually, I'm probably getting the wrong way around. But it's about empathy. It's about storytelling. It's about meaning. It's about play. It's about symphony. So in other words, it's, it's about the best things that the best of what makes us human. And that doesn't stop at the door when you go to work, that you bring that into work. And certainly for me, I've always said to my son, I honestly really genuinely don't care what you do to, to put bread on the table. But what I really wish for you is that when you go to work in the morning, it's not like going to work. All right, because you will work harder, you will do more. And, and I think, again, as you've just said, the last six months, an awful lot of people are thinking, actually, is this really what I want to do with the rest of my life? And do I really want to be on this hamster wheel? No, I don't. And then it's, it's taking that risk. And I think it's been amazing that the number of new internet businesses and people are, are doing well. And obviously, it's always a struggle when you start, but it's about finding that niche because invariably we are all individuals. We all have unique selling points and you just have to find out what your niche is and go and fill it. And all of a sudden you can make bread for the table and you have meaning and it makes you happy. And I'm making it sound so simple because it's not that simple, but I, I do, I hope that is the future because in a future where you, nobody, nobody is born wanting to go and work in a factory on a conveyor belt. That is, nobody wants that. that. Nobody wants that. And if we have machines and we have robots and we have the, the technology to do that, humans will be liberated to do other things. And everyone is like, yeah, but how are they going to make a living? We will find other ways that we haven't done before. We might need universal basic income, but okay, so, but you will still be able to go and do other things. And take care of the planet, take care of each other. And yes, I'm now in my utopia, <laughs> utopian mode, but I cannot see any other type of future because the way that we've done it hasn't worked. It hasn't worked and we can see that. There's, you know, we've done the experiment. Uh, you can't have eternal growth. It doesn't exist. This, this idea that it's just, you know, it's unsustainable. Um, so I'm very excited about the future. And what's lovely about having talks like this and presenting this to other people is that the penny drops with others and they go, do you know, cause I've had this so many times recently, people go, they send me a message and they went, thank you for giving me permission. I just needed to hear somebody give me permission and then they're off. Mm. And so it's a real privilege to be able to do that. Thank you so much for that, Jasmine. I mean, this has been a really, really nice conversation. I think this last bit, I mean, there is a book, uh, probably you know called Utopia for Realists. Uh, is oh yeah, I've got it. It's on my list. It's on my pile to read. <laughs> um, it does summarize all of this. I mean, the book is a few years old now. He actually has a new book called Humankind that just came out this summer. I finished reading it not a long time ago, and it does what you said does summarize that book, and it does uh, summarize the fact that you know we need to be hopeful about. Uh, the future and we we cannot just be become cyn cynics and like think oh no there is there is no solution because i i agree with you that you know that that energy in ch is changing and and there is like this feeling of awakening i think happening all over the world and in a way i mean covid is a horrible thing that happened to us but i do try and look at the positive sides of this and the more conversations I have with people about this, the more I understand that there is really this like collective awakening and we're all like 
thinking about ways to uh, move forward. And just before we finish, I wanted to ask you uh, one more question about like, what is there for you in terms of like coming uh, um, work that is coming up uh, soon and where can we see it? And if there is anything you can share with us about it. <laughs> Uh, I can't be, there is, there is quite a lot coming up, but I will be showing in London next year. Uh, so there will be um, group exhibitions and um, hoping to have a solo show as well next year. And there is some work internationally. I'm sorry I'm being all cagey about it, but I can't. I can't. So um, yeah, so there'll be, there'll be an awful, there will be lots of new work. So the best thing to do with me really is to you can always have a look on Instagram. I'm forever kind of keeping people up to date with things like this. Um, lots of new collaboration. And yeah, I will be looking at new technologies as well. So um, just, yeah, just keep up. I'm sorry I'm being a bit cagey about things. <laughs> just keep up to date with what I'm doing. And, and uh, it's, very, it's very exciting. It's, yeah, I can, I can tell that next year is um, going to be a year of immense change, not just for me, but for an awful lot of people. Because that's the thing, you come out of hibernation like this and, and you think, right, ready to go. What is it I need to do? <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, just, yeah, best thing with me is always to just look on Instagram with me now. It's pretty much, I don't really use any of the other platforms, but I do keep people updated on that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yasmin. My pleasure. It was really nice uh, this, having this time with you and um, learned so much. And also, thank you for, like, you know, sharing your experience and, and and really helping i'm sure like people watching these are probably going to also think about this as like opening new windows and new doors yes. and possibilities and thank you so much for that my absolute pleasure shows up thank you for coming